This is Deb Donig with Technically Human, a podcast about ethics and technology, where I ask what it means to be human in the age of tech. Each week, I interview industry leaders, thinkers, writers, and technologists, and I ask them about how they understand the relationship between humans and the technologies we create. We discuss how we can build a better vision for technology, one that represents the best of our human values. Welcome to another episode of Technically Human, where we bridge the fascinating worlds of technology, culture, and what it means to be human in the digital age. I'm your host, Deb Donig. In today's episode, we're exploring the release of a fascinating new book, ChatGPT MD, by Dr. Robert Pearl, MD. This book takes on an exploratory journey into the world of artificial intelligence and medicine, discussing the potentials and pitfalls of integrating generative AI like ChatGPT into healthcare practices. Dr. Pearl, with his extensive background as a physician and a thought leader in healthcare innovation, provides compelling arguments and narratives that make us rethink the future of medical care. And now here's a bit of amusing meta commentary for you. This introduction was actually penned by ChatGPT itself. Yes, you heard that right. In a twist that mirrors the very essence of our show, we're utilizing generative AI to kickstart a conversation about the role of generative AI in our lives. It's a reflection of the times we live in, where technology not only becomes a subject of our discussions, but also an active participant in them. So buckle up as we delve into these thought-provoking themes with Dr. Robert Pearl, featuring his insights into the future of AI in medicine. It promises to be an enlightening journey into understanding how we remain technically human in an increasingly digital world. Wow, that introduction was a journey. Okay, so we're back to me voicing things on my own. What did you think about ChatGPT's intro to the show? Before we get to the conversation with Dr. Pearl, here's my two cents now that ChatGPT has had its two cents. For 18 years, Dr. Robert Pearl, MD, served as CEO of the Permanente Medical Group, Kaiser Permanente. He is the former president of the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group. In these roles, he led 10,000 physicians, 38,000 staff, and was responsible for the nationally recognized medical care of 5 million Kaiser Permanente members on the West and East Coasts. He's a clinical professor of plastic surgery at Stanford University School of Medicine and on the faculty at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where he teaches courses on healthcare strategy, technology, and leadership. Dr. Pearl is board certified in plastic and reconstructive surgery, receiving his medical degree from Yale, followed by a residency in plastic and reconstructive surgery at Stanford University. In ChatGPT MD, Dr. Pearl teams up with artificial intelligence system ChatGPT to examine the transformational power of generative AI in medicine. Together, the co-authors present a vision for the future where doctors, patients, and AI join forces to reclaim control of American healthcare from prevailing corporate interests. Hi, Ravi. Hey, Deb. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm really excited for this conversation. And I want to start off by asking you to talk about the title of your new book. It comes out this week, the same uh, week as this podcast is being recorded. The book is titled ChatGPT MD. How AI-Empowered Patients and Doctors Can Take Back Control of American Medicine. So this title is interesting to me because it gets at two formative dimensions of the book. First, the idea that generative AI is a critical and revolutionary tool that will transform American medicine. And second, that American medicine is, in a sense, out of control, requiring a new technology to revolutionize it. Can we talk about these two claims that seem to animate the book? Absolutely. So the book is now out. It's already number one on Amazon's new best books. Uh, I was published on Tuesday, three days before the podcast will be broadcast. And the book is Chad GPT MD, How AI Empowered Patients and Doctors Can Take Back Control of American Medicine. And you raise two issues, but there's actually three or four or five other ones. The first one was a recognition of how powerful ChatGPT, and I use that to represent all of the generative AI tools. It's not specific to OpenAI, it also includes Gemini and other platforms. 
how powerful it was, but more importantly, how powerful it will become. It's doubling in power every year. That exponential growth is beyond human brain ability to understand it. You know, we think about our arithmetic, one, two, three, four, our brains do fine with that. Geometry, two, four, eight, uh, so on. Our brains do okay with that. Exponential growth, we, we don't get. Let's say you have a pond with a lily pond, uh, with a lily plant on top of it that replicates every night. And on day 50, it's going to be completely covered with lily pods. And I ask you on day 49, what percent of the pond is covered? Well, it's 50%. Day 48, it's 25%. Day 47, it's only 12.5%. You go to day 42, 43, it's a little green around the edges. That's all. We don't understand how fast it's going to change. Five years from now, generative AI is going to be 30 times more powerful. So the things that I'm talking about are not what exists today. Your listeners shouldn't use generative AI to make their own diagnoses, to manage their own chronic diseases, but they will be able to do so not in some distant future time period. I'm talking about a mere three to five years, but now therefore is the time to think about it. The second part of the exponential growth was when I decided to write this book in the fall. And I wrote it because it was clear to me how this technology was both so powerful at the time, the version that existed, but would become so much more powerful in the future. I knew that if I took the usual publishing path, about two years, in fact, nine months usually from the completion of the manuscript to it being available to readers, everything I wrote would be out of date. So the second thing I decided is I needed to make the whole process go faster. And who better to assist me than ChatGPT? And I called ChatGPT a co-author. Quite a laborious process, by the way. I had to put in the 1.2 million words that I published in the past. And I unfortunately had to do that multiple times because the advances since then, things like memory, were not available when I first started this project. And then I had to do literally thousands of back and forth prompts and reprompting the way you might have you and I were writing a book together, sending email drafts through the uh, internet, in this case, being able to load it into chat GPT. And so the book, although it's a co-author, it's really a authorship, I'd say, that I'm a bit more senior on, but chat GPT helped me speed up the process. So the ChatGPT was both a combination of the role that it will play and the role that it already can do to assist that where it's going to be. In terms of the control, the answer is the control has been lost by the traditional doctor and patient. It's been taken over by corporate interests driven by the finances and the economics, not the quality outcome. It's interesting that my first two books, and by the way, the profits from all three books go to Doctors Without Borders, which is a wonderful charity uh, that supports care around the globe. The uh, opportunity to be able to utilize this technology to solve what has been, I call it the holy grail. How do you increase quality, simultaneously improve access, and make healthcare more affordable. This is what we think of as value-based care. You can actually trace its origins back to 1932, the CCMC, the Committee for the Control of Medical Costs. This is not a new problem. But what I could see then was that we now had a potential solution, that generative AI could empower patients. It could allow patients to do, and I'm making this up as an estimate. I don't have any science behind this piece. 20% of what physicians do in the office today. It would allow them to get care 24 by 7, to be able to gain not just knowledge, but expertise. And in doing that, the combination of an empowered patient, a dedicated clinician, and generative AI could now wrest away from the corporate entities to the financially driven aspects of healthcare, control, improving health, and improving the experience for both doctors and patients, which by the way, today is not very good with 60% of clinicians reporting burnout and 70% of patients saying the healthcare system is fundamentally 
explored. So my hope is that in this conversation, we can walk through all of those four doors that you opened. Uh, but right from the get-go, my my mind goes directly to, to wanting to open door number two, which is the door of writing this book with ChatGPT as a co-author. You told us a little bit about that process um, and what inspired that process. But I also wanted to ask you, what you what were you trying to accomplish or convey in writing that book with ChatGPT? And how did it work out? What did you discover or learn through that process about ChatGPT, about writing, and about the interplay between generative AI and medical knowledge? Part of my wanting to use ChatGPT was just to demonstrate what's possible. This is a completely new technology. I think of it as like the iPhone in 2007. I remember my dad got his first iPhone. He kept it in the trunk of his car in case he ever had an accident and needed to be able to call for help. Compare that to what we do today, being able to uh, order things through retail, being able to book entire travel trips, uh, music, the photography, all of the opportunities, GPS, uh, in terms of driving instructions, it's so, it, what is it, its uses are so beyond what was available at the time in the same way that what's available today was not going to be in the future. But you had to understand what the phone could do in 2007. You need to understand what ChatGPT, generative AI, can do today. So I thought that was an important piece to be able to demonstrate that. And so there's one entire chapter that I let ChatGPT write, I'll say 90% on its own, and it's well title so every reader will know which chapter it is and can compare it to the surrounding chapters that were written predominantly by me but with a lot of assistance from uh, chat gpt so i would say that it was i don't want to call it tongue-in-cheek because chat gpt did a lot of the work and i want the readers to know that but i think that anyone who believes that you know generative ai today can write a entire textbook without a massive amount of energy uh, that's Incorrect. So that was why I included ChatGPT. What was the experience like? It was a combination of both very enlightening and frustrating. The enlightening part, part was the massive amount of help that it gave me. Finding sources, providing backgrounds, being able to take what I write and shift it slightly in terms of tone, being able to uh, uh, make parts be a bit more serious and parts a little bit lighter. It was also frustrating. It hallucinated a complete episode of Exploration of the North Pole that, as far as I can tell, never ever happened. It was a great story, but it was not one that was accurate and obviously never made it into the final book. Uh, and as I said also at the time, remember, I'm writing this back in the fall of 2023. Memory doesn't yet exist. That was called um, plugins. GPTs didn't yet exist. Those tools are now available. This is how fast the technology is moving. What are these tools? Well, a plugin is a beautiful visual. It's not actually what happens. You plug something into the system, meaning you can download data. So if you want to include your entire medical record, you could try to think about, well, how are you going to type for days on end? Because there's a lot of information, including your entire genetic analysis, let's say. You could theoretically imagine being attached to a machine that would download it. It obviously does it in a different way using Bluetooth and other approaches. Probably that's why they shifted the name to GPTs. But it took it was pretty laborious to put in all that information, 1.2 million words. Uh, you can't just give it a big file at the time and have it be incorporated. And the second part was memory. I had to do it not once but multiple times because the technology would not be able to remember it. OpenAI announced memory a couple of months ago. It's not yet available for most users, but it's coming I'll say certainly within the next year. Had I had both these tools, it would have been a lot better. Had I had the next version, GPT-5 instead of 4, it would have been a lot easier, a lot more accurate. And again, this is the mindset I'd like listeners to be thinking about. Don't look at what exists right now. Particularly don't look at it if you're using the free version. The one I use, GPT-4, is $20 a month, about a latte a week. Uh, it's not excessive in cost and is much better than the original version, the 3.0 or 3.5 uh, version of the technology. Think about the GPT-5 that's going to certainly come out sometime next year and how much better it's going to be, including the opportunity of plugins and memory. Now, why is this so important in medicine? Because 
we'll talk in a few minutes about how ChatGPT will change care delivery. And to do that, you want personalized care. And to do that, you want the application to know all of your particular information, your genetics, your family history, medications, your lab results. And that requires a download process, GPTs or plugins, and a memory. So when you come back and say, I woke up this morning with a fever of 102 and a cough, and I'm concerned, it won't have to start at the beginning. It'll take all that information that you've put into place. It'll start asking you a series of questions. And the same ones, by the way, that clinician would ask. And I'm going to guess that it'll give you a diagnosis at that point that is incredibly accurate. I was on a podcast earlier this week, and the host was telling me independently about her husband who had had a skiing accident that was having pain in his shoulder. And I thought I knew as a clinician what he had. And I said, by the way, why don't you go into ChatGPT, because she had the 4.0 version, and enter all the information you can think of and see what it comes up with. And she wrote me back and said, it's amazing how accurate it is. It had the right diagnosis, it had the right diagnostic services and the right treatment, which unfortunately was surgery that he needed, he would not have gotten had he not gone through the process of asking for input. And that I think will be a radical change. We can talk a little bit about the fact that what uh, generative AI does is not just provide knowledge like Google does. You go to Google, you click on a link, and it gives you information out of an article. That's information. It gives you expertise. You can now make a diagnosis, manage a disease, be able to get certain treatments, the ones that don't require a prescription. This is a radical shift, as radical as the iPhone, as radical as the internet, as radical as the printing press was with uh, Johannes Gutenberg. So these are things that I want to get into in a little bit. But before I, I let you move on uh, and dive deeper into some of the topics that you just brought up in terms of what this will do to American healthcare, I think it's important for us to build on and establish a little bit of context about what you described as the emergent focus of American medicine since the 1930s in terms of expanding care on the one hand and improving care on the other hand, that kind of dual set of obligations or visions that seem to have had a very difficult time for the uh, both American policy landscape as well as the American medical landscape to, to get accomplished. And of course, um, given the economics of medicine, very difficult time getting accomplished. And to answer, uh, I think, the number of questions that come up in this, I, I kind of want to uh, pose uh, a question about the stages of American healthcare since I would presume around the 1930s. Let me go to the conclusion and then go back to the beginning. The conclusion is after, I'd say, at least a decade of believing that once people understood what needed to happen, what should happen, what was the right thing to happen, what was best for patients and health and outcomes that it would happen, I've become more realistic. I've recognized that change doesn't happen simply because it is the right thing to do. There are a lot of other forces. And that's what led me to this analysis in the different stages. Healthcare 1.0 traced back to 1930, 1950, 1960, but really going into about 1990, 2000. This 1.0 era was a time of major advance where the technology created and implemented allowed superior clinical outcomes for patients and did so at a lower cost. What were some examples of this? You have the diagnostic tools, CT, MRI, ultrasound, the ability to see inside the human body and be able to make a diagnosis that would allow more rapid care, better care, superior outcomes. You had machines like the heart-lung machine that allow heart surgery to be done, to revascularize the blood vessels to the heart after a uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack. And therefore be able to save a life and be able to do so in a preventive way. We had a lot of knowledge expansion, not quite the technology in, in that way, where we came to understand what's the cause of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure, and being able to come up with ways to prevent it in the first place. We saw the development of quite a number of vaccines. We could spend an entire program talking about the advances 
Healthcare 1.0 was a wonderful era in which we saw a tremendous increase in life expectancy for all Americans. Then we get to the year 2000. The big fear everyone had the year 2000 was Y2K, that all these machines would crash because they couldn't accommodate the shift in the century, going from a 19-something to a 20-something. But we managed to get by that. And on the horizon, the holy grail, we had the electronic health record. Instead of having your information in eight or 10 different doctor's offices, every time you saw a different physician, you had another uh, amount of information locked into a paper record and sitting in an office that's locked, by the way, every night and weekends, two thirds of the week, it's closed. We now have immediate availability and what's called interoperability. Data would be shared. Clinicians would have all the information. We could avoid duplication of services. We could go through a massive amount of opportunity. And now, almost a quarter of a century later, it hasn't happened. And why hasn't it happened? Because rather than using the electronic health record in Healthcare 2.0 to benefit patients improve health, it was used predominantly as a financial tool to increase billing and claims. The EHR slowed down doctors. It got literally in the way between doctors and patients. Physicians no longer can look at the patient. They've had to be looking at the screen in order to type information. We could have designed the systems different, used them differently, and advanced healthcare. Instead, it has not done very much. Healthcare 3.0 was the internet era. This was the opportunity to book an appointment online, to email your physician, to send a text message would be a tremendous opportunity, telemedicine. You don't have to actually see the physician in person. You can send information, get information back. It doesn't have to be, it can be asynchronous. You can send it early in the day. It could be a physician at a, at a distant location and get that information back by the time you wake up in the morning. It didn't happen either. And why didn't it happen? Because clinicians were not going to be reimbursed for those services. They didn't want to be bothered with it. They thought that their office was the best place to provide that care. So we have one era, tremendous success. Two eras, I'd call them failures. And now what's healthcare 4.0? It's generative AI. It's this next period of time. And we'll have to see what happens. I present in ChatGPT MD a, a positive vision for how it can be used by doctors and patients. But I also, in the book, talk about some of the risks in part four, privacy, security, uh, bias, misinformation. And in, but in five, I talk about leadership. This won't necessarily happen unless we can find the ways to make sure that the technology is used in ways that don't slow down physicians. And it's used in ways that don't compromise the economics. And I don't say that in a pejorative or negative way. It's just the reality that exists. Clinicians are increasingly busy, and they're not going to embrace a technology that takes more of their time. And none of us would embrace a change that would undermine our own financial and family security. Right. And I would say that, that, that this gets to the heart of, I think, where some of my suspicion and some of my objections come in. And so I want to I dig into that. Um, perhaps you can ameliorate some of them because you've just spoken a lot about uh, a particular history that digital technologies have had and a particular trajectory that they've taken in American healthcare, particularly the promises and the disasters that you've described of e electronic health records or EHRs. And you point out, you pointed out here, I think quite reasonably, that many medical professionals might be wary of the promises being made by those who champion the institution of generative AI in medicine, because the last time digital technologies made vast promises that digital interventions would provide a vast salve for medical professionals and patients, the end result was a vast burden of extra labor that made practicing medicine more laborious, less fun, that cost doctors more time, and that was less effective. And as I like to say, we have seen this movie before. Technology just invent some labor-saving or efficiency device sold with great promises and at great costs, only for those who actually then have to use those devices and technologies to find themselves burdened with additional time costs, additional labor, and additional costs to the joy of practicing their craft. So what makes you certain that this 
will not be the case with generative AI. Why won't this be a rerun, so to speak, of the movie that we already saw about digital technologies and their vast promises and their vast failures in healthcare? I can't tell you for certain that it won't be, but I can tell you why I'm optimistic that it won't be. And it's a two-part answer. The first one is because things have gotten so bad, we're almost at the point where anything is going to be better than what currently exists. Why do I say that? Well, life expectancy is now stagnated. It's no better now than it was 20 years ago. We're almost six years behind the other 12 most industrialized nations. Healthcare has become unaffordable. Over half of Americans who are insured can't pay their medical bills because the out-of-pocket costs have become so great. 400,000 people die annually from misdiagnoses. Another 400,000 have permanent injury as a result of misdiagnoses. One in four hospital patients will have a misdiagnosis during their stay. Quarter of a million people die from medical error. Hundreds of thousands of people who should have had a disease, a chronic disease prevented and at least had better management to avoid its complication are dying annually. We could spend again an entire show on the shortcomings of American medicine. Too expensive, quality not matching where it needs to be. And as I said earlier, 70% of Americans say the system needs to change. They can't get the access they desire. So we could talk a lot about that. And I think we've gotten to the breaking point, particularly with 60% of doctors feeling burned out and nurses leaving, talking about 90% of nurses questioning whether they want to stay in, in the uh, profession. So I think people will embrace it to a large extent because everything else has gotten bad. And let me also point out that according to the federal government, healthcare costs are going to increase $3 trillion annually over the next seven years. $3 trillion. That's a 75% increase in the cost of healthcare. Who believes that we can afford to pay that? So either it's going to bankrupt the country or what we're going to see is progressive skipping on care and we're going to see all the problems that patients have getting worse and worse and the frustrations of doctors growing. So I, again, litany of, of problems that need to be addressed. So maybe that's why today will be different. But as I emphasize in part five, we also have to address the economics with the providers of care. If we don't do that, it's not going to work. And the current system of payment is called fee-for-service. And I know that many of your listeners are not in the medical field, so I'll give a little bit more detail. You know, the more you do, the more you get paid. Whether there's any good or not, doesn't matter. In fact, when there's a complication, you often get paid twice. See a patient two times for this for a problem that could have been taken care of once, and you make twice as much money. No one does it intentionally trying to harm patients or cheat insurance companies. But what we know is that incentives do change behavior, and there's enough information and data in the literature that it happens. And I can give you a lot of examples if we'd want to see it, but leave it at the fact that the economics in, I'll call it a transactional relationship, you come to me as a clinician, I provide care to you, I submit a bill and I get paid. That's the model that worked in the last century when the problems that patients had were appendicitis, trauma, or pneumonia, things that were unpreventable and could be taken care of relatively quickly. In this century, the medical problems that patients have are different. What we see now is chronic disease. 60% of Americans have chronic disease. These are diabetes, hypertension, asthma. These are the kind of problems that are either preventable or as complications are preventable through good management. Complications like heart attacks and strokes and cancer. And so the opportunity to use this technology to drive health, to avoid disease, to lower costs by raising quality, to by, by providing greater service. These just didn't, both the technology didn't exist and the problems didn't exist. And so what needs to happen is a shift from this transactional fee for service, so now I want to use another word that will be new to your listeners, capitation. A single payment to take care of a population of patients where you go for the entire cost. What does that do? It aligns incentives. Charlie Munger, who was the uh, brains really in Berkshire Hathaway, along with Buffett, said, tell me your incentives 
and I'll tell you the outcomes you're going to get. As soon as you have this prepayment, this alignment of incentives, preventing disease becomes more important. The ability to coordinate care, avoid redundancy of care, all of the tools that are necessary to be able to elevate quality, improve access, and lower costs suddenly happen if you have generative AI. So it's this combination of paying differently, technology, empowered patients and doctors working together. That's why I'm optimistic that a change can happen if we can evolve the economic system. Well, this for me was one of the most interesting dimensions of the book. Uh, in this chapter, you talk about the macroeconomics and the competitive landscape of healthcare. You've just described a little bit of that landscape, which to quote somebody who has not previously been quoted in this podcast, former President Donald Trump, who knew that healthcare could be this complicated, as he once said, um, is very complicated. <laughs> I wonder if you could expand a little bit on the point that you're making to talk about how exactly generative AI will intervene into that landscape, not just directly in terms of providing more information to doctors and patients that may lead to better outcomes or to help manage chronic illnesses and the outcomes of chronic illnesses and the complications that come along with them, but by changing the macroeconomics and the competitive landscape of healthcare, what is it about generative AI, in other words, that will be transformational? What is it about generative AI that will be uh, transformational, not just to doctors and how doctors are compensated, but also inclusive of the insurance business, the cost of healthcare, but also the politics of healthcare? If you think about a capitated model, you can start to see all of the positive outcomes that can occur. And you put that into the context of what's inconvenient for the patient and the work overload leading to burnout for the physician. You start to see the application of this technology to the provision of healthcare. I'll give you a few examples. Chronic disease I mentioned is 60% of Americans have at least one chronic disease, if not multiple. Chronic disease means your problem exists every day. How do we take care of it in medicine in this transactional fee-for-service world? We see you three or four times a year. For three or four months at a time, we have, doctors have no idea what's happening with patients. Is your diabetes getting worse or better? I don't know how many of your listeners could even guess that we control diabetes, type 2 diabetes, less than half of the time. High blood pressure. We know how to control high blood pressure. We should have about a 90, 95% control rate, 55 to 60% in the United States. Hypertension is the number one cause of strokes and kidney failure. Strokes are contributes to, diabetes, to kidney failure and heart disease. What we know is that diabetes is the number one cause of kidney failure and a major contributor to heart disease. We could take care of a lot of these problems, but we don't do so. Why not? Because doctors borrow the time to call you every day. We have wearable devices that can do monitoring of all of your problems. They can tell you how your blood pressure is doing, how your blood sugar is doing, but they're not used very much. Why? Because the technology that exists creates a lot of data that has to go to a doctor or another human being to analyze it. And if it's a clinician, they don't have the time to do it. If it's going to be another individual, it costs way too much to accomplish it. ChatGPT can, can do that right now. And with plugins, it can follow what your doctor recommends for your treatment. What are the bounds around the blood pressure? What are the bounds around the blood sugar? And if we could do that, and data says that places like Kaiser Permanente that use different, health, different systems to accomplish it and, and relied on the fact that it's a very integrated system with a comprehensive electronic health record, none of which exists in most communities, they were able to lower the chances of patients developing a heart attack by 30%, a stroke by 30%, cancer in many cases by 30 and 40%. This is a remarkable improvement in health reduction in cost, reduction in demand, all of a sudden it creates the solution if the economics align with it. Another example is an acute problem. It's 11 o'clock at night and your kid has a fever, 102, 102 and a half. What should you do? Go to the ER where you're likely to wait several hours surrounded by people who are sick or wait till the morning and your child can have a major problem, even die across that night. Go to Google, you're not going to get an answer what to do. Call your doctor's office. They can tell you to go to the ER because that's what they tell you all the time. How do you figure this out? This is where expertise that I mentioned earlier becomes so important. Now, will ChatGPT be perfect? No. But what we do today is really imperfect. 
it's just going to be a lot better than the complete lack of expertise that patients face at nights and often across the weekend. A third opportunity is what's called the hospital at home. What we know is about 30% of patients who are admitted to a hospital don't really need to be there if they could be monitored at home, a place where they would be surrounded by loved ones, a place where they wouldn't be disrupted in their sleep every night with noise and lights. But it doesn't happen today. ChatGPT can do that monitoring and could notify a small number of doctors or nurses about what's happening with patients and who needs additional care so that you probably would get oversight faster than the typical hospital in the United States today. Look inside the hospital today. A nurse comes around and looks at you and comes back four or six hours later. What happens in the interim? We ignore these blocks of time where the problems that are going to develop happen, but they're not seen except in an ICU or some other place with high intensity monitoring. When you put all these pieces together, what you see is that not only would quality go up, but the amount of demands on the clinicians start to go down and patient care becomes 24 by seven far more convenient. Care becomes affordable. This is the opportunity that I see and I could give you a dozen more ways in which it could be applied as well. Okay, so you've convinced me that we need a revolution in medicine. But the question for me still remains, is generative AI the right revolution for medicine? And I want to quote you here. You you write in the book that, and, and here's the quote, I've concluded that the changes in medicine won't happen simply because change is the right thing to do. The revolution in healthcare will be willed into existence primarily by economic necessity. Phrased differently, it will happen when there is no other choice. And that is a situation in which we find ourselves today. End quote. Okay, so sold, sold on this. But is GAI the right revolution to intervene into medicine as it stands right now? I think about other revolutions, such as political revolutions, that might lead to an adoption of healthcare and a healthcare system that avoids much of what you describe as a specifically American mess of healthcare, such as a revolution that might give us healthcare systems like that of Canada or Germany. Why a technological revolution in particular? And how do we ensure that this revolution ends up with the public as winners, as opposed to, as it seems to be the case, with so many of the digital technologies and the digital technology revolutions that we've recently had, such as the social media revolution and what might be argued emerge from that, which is an erosion of democracy or other FAANG or FAIN companies and the revolution that they brought, as well as the erosion of privacy and information security. How do we ensure that the public wins rather than a small group of shareholders and technologists who will reap massive profits at the expense of potential uh, vast social damage? If I can convince you, Deb, that, that it's the right direction, I feel really good because you're a tough, tough audience. So thank you for that. But what I would say is that as the quote states, I don't see these other solutions working in the United States. As an example, we had a lot of emphasis on healthcare for all, Medicare for all, as you may remember in 2020. And the enthusiasm wasn't there. Congress was not able to pass the legislation. I don't see it happening in the near future. And we have to understand that some of these systems are able to accomplish what it does at the expense of patient access and convenience. It is not what Americans want in the United States. And I say that based just upon the polling and the surveys that I've read. I go back to, I don't see another alternative way to solve it. The political debate in Congress is so slow to make the smallest evolution that to change in radical ways the compensation because that's a major part of how other countries keep the cost low. The delays in care, the reduction in hospital availability for anything that's not emergent. I, I just don't see this being concordant with American ethos and American politics. I don't see elected officials going in that direction. So I go back to the fact that I don't see an alternative that can be driven from inside the system. I think it would require such a radical restructuring of everything we do in the country, of the entire economics, that I'm doubtful that it will occur, unlike generative AI, where I do believe that it could happen 
fast that patients will embrace it. Just look at what's happened with Expedia. You know, you go back a decade, 15 years ago, you had to go to a travel agent. Now you go online at night. You don't just do it during the day when the office is open. You do it 24 by 7. Think about your finances that you can manage from your house. If you have a check, you don't have to go to the bank. You just put it into your phone. You're able to deposit money. These are things that patients, that, that consumers, patients being consumers, consumers embrace. And I don't see that they're not going to be able to do that in medicine. And similarly, if we can make one change, which is in the reimbursement methodology, then I see physicians being able to say to a patient, here are the things to do. Here are the ways to enter data. And that's part of why I wrote the book now. We have to start training people, teaching people how to do this kind of data entry, not to use the information to replace some of the things done by clinicians, but to augment it today and in the future to be able to uh, reduce it. So the question really becomes, so I take all of the concerns, and let me also say that in terms of privacy and security, it's not that we're perfect in a generative AI, it's just that they're no worse than what exists today when you go and click a link on your Google. So we're not talking about augmenting it, in fact, we're probably talking about diminishing it because they, so far, at least the generative AI tools are subscription-based and they're not advertising-based. We could talk about that in greater detail from a uh, economic and ethical perspective that sits in place. So the question really becomes, can we move from fee-for-service to capitation? What's standing in the way? And I would say that the answer is yes, because if you're a half of a called commercial insurance, this is the insurance you get through your employer, half of commercial insurance is paid by the business directly, not through an insurance company. So if you're the owner of a business, wouldn't you like to know what it's going to cost you this year for your health care? Do you want to just get a bill every month and find out, oh my gosh, it went up 30%. And that is what a capitated payment does because you pay for the year for all of your X number of employees that are going to be covered under your plans. I see them wanting to do it. The same, by the way, for insurers because insurers really don't like doing some of the uh, pernicious things that they implement today like prior authorization where a clinician has to call the insurance company to get approval. The insurance company is going to say no to anything that's expensive. The clinician will have to send back forms. We go back and forth like ping pong until ultimately it happens some of the time, but most of the time people give up or something else intervenes. I think they'd like to get out of that situation, assuming that the pricing would be appropriate. And clinicians are burned out. So when I look at all the pieces, I see it being better for almost every part of the industry, not every part. And you said earlier about you know medicine is complex. It's 20% of the gross domestic product. All the dollars we spend on everything in the United States, that's the gross domestic product. And one-fifth of it is healthcare. So who's not going to like it? Well, drug companies might not like it because right now they're selling multi-million dollar drugs that may or may not have any benefit but they get paid in millions of dollars, whether it works or not. Some of the device manufacturers might not for devices that sound good and attract patients, but don't have any uh, salutary impact in terms of clinical outcomes. Uh, some hospitals might not like it because they're going to close because we won't need as many. If we have a hospital care at home, with higher quality, better outcomes and uh, better uh, safety for patients. So there are some people who are going to be disappointed and they're going to fight it. And so I envision a battle happening, and I'll call it between the good guys and the more problematic uh, corporate institutions. And I'm a, I wrote the book to encourage the good guys to step forward, to take the chance to have the courage. And if they do that, and it'll be a lot of good women, by the way, uh, then we can, I have an optimism that it actually will occur. Well, there's one set of actors that we've spoken a little bit about. I'm not sure whether they fall into the category of good guys or corporate institutions, maybe both. That actor is, of course, giant tech companies like Amazon and Apple and Google. And in your book, you spend a little bit of time thinking about the possibility and the plausibility. And some of this is speculative and some of this is drawing from the already existing entry from companies like CVS and Walmart and Apple and Amazon into the healthcare arena. And, and some of it is, is, as I said, speculative and plausible that big tech companies will take over healthcare and that there's a likelihood that 
especially with the advent of generative AI and the control of generative AI that these companies as technology companies have, as well as the control they have over the developmental direction of these technologies, will position them to be healthcare providers and facilitators. I'm wondering what you think of that future. Which category, that is to say the good guys or the corporate self-motivated, profit incentive motivated actors, do they fall into? What do you think of that future? I know in the book you point toward the excellence of these companies in facilitating highly logistically coordinated ventures at competitive market prices, which you seem to view as more advantageous than the current landscape of middlemen, opaque pricing structures for care that often lead to burdening patients with outrageous costs and debts for that care, and poor health care quality and outcomes. But you also cite concerns about privacy, about advertising leverage, and all sorts of consequences if these companies should take over both in the political and the economic landscapes. What do you walk away with after considering a future with Amazon and Apple overseeing our health? Is this an optimal outcome? What ethical or equity risks might there be in this future? Should we be excited or concerned? Are these category one actors, good guys, or category two actors, corporate profit-driven incentive actors, uh, or are they both? So Yogi Berra, a very famous baseball player, once said that the future is very hard to predict, especially when it hasn't come yet. And I would say that that's where we are when it comes to some of these businesses. I can create a scenario in which I think it will work well and one in which it won't. And probably even the companies don't know because they'll be dependent upon external forces. But let me, I'll say, offer some thoughts, some foundational ways for listeners to think about this question. First of all, these are very consumer-driven companies. Uh, this morning, I was in a situation where I had to uh, change some lights in my house. And I said, uh, and I'm living right now in a new area, and I was trying to figure out what store might have them. I was in Costco the other day, and I couldn't find them. And I said, oh, just go to Amazon. It's going to be here this afternoon. Think about that from a consumer perspective. Where in healthcare today can you get that kind of immediate service where I know exactly what it's going to cost? I get a good price. It is going to be delivered to my home when I want it, where I want it, what I want. That's the consumer driven company. So the question will be, will these companies when it comes to healthcare stay customer focused? I can't tell you. I'm not sure that they know whether it's going to be as applicable in medicine. Second of all, what I've seen is that they're moving in this direction though. Clay Christensen, that many of your students read in their economic courses, talked about disruptive change. And disruptive change always happens from an outsider coming into an industry because those inside the industry refused to change. Kodak knew about a filmless camera, but it made so much money on the film, it never implemented the filmless camera. So Apple and others had to come along to make it occur. The examples are multiple, numerous. Healthcare could be the same. What I hope is that those inside the profession will lead the way. I believe they will do a better job. But if they don't, I'm also equally convinced that someone from outside of it will. And whether they will end up as good guys or bad guys, we'll have to see. But why do I say that? Because all three of them have acquired primary care groups. Amazon acquired One Medical, a very large organization founded in California. You have that CVS brought in its own primary care group, Oak Street. Walmart is talking with a group called ShedMed about coming into the organization that's working with United Healthcare that already employs 90,000 physicians. They all have pharmacies They're looking at ways of delivering medications with drones faster than available in medicine today. They're looking at what's called Medicare Advantage. So for people over the age of 65, they become eligible for Medicare, and Medicare has two tracks, one that's fee-for-service, well, traditional Medicare, and one that's paid in this prepaid, capitated way called Medicare Advantage. They are big players in that arena. I look at them as armies massing on the edge of an invasion of another country. They haven't yet crossed the border, or maybe they've just sent a couple of small little troops to go across the border and find out what's going on, but they're preparing, I think, for the opportunity to move forward. Will they stick to this vision? Will they devolve into some kind of 
Once again, transactional way to support their retail business. That's what I don't know. But I can see at least the possibility. I think it could be really good. But as you pointed out, it also could be just a repeat of the failures of healthcare 2.0 and 3.0. That's what we'll see. It's not going to happen in a year or two. Probably won't happen in the five years that I see generative AI, but I believe that it will happen within a decade. I guess it's worth mentioning at this point that in the past two years, uh, at least three of those companies have been sued by the U.S. government under the Federal Trade Commission for antitrust and monopolistic practices. Apple uh, was sued as recently as as March of this year, and Amazon and Google were both sued uh, under the same rubric last year for this. So what kinds of regulation or what kinds of governance practices or what kind of legislation do we need to pass in order to ensure that when these companies, and you, I think, are suggesting that they will enter into this market, um, prices do remain competitive and not monopolistic, that patients uh, are prioritized in terms of their care outcomes rather than profits. Uh, I know you have suggested that aligning profit motivations with best care practices is one means by which to ensure that healthcare remains deliverable in a, a way that promotes um, patient priorities and, and medical excellence. But are there regulatory needs or legislative uh, needs that need to come to bear in order to ensure there are non-monopolistic practices? This is a very important question you're raising, Deb. And I think it's important to look at some of these antitrust suits. And much of the antitrust suits are because they are, I'll say it, almost the sole provider. So Apple is a good example. You buy an iPhone and the question becomes, on that iPhone, do you have competitive balance between the apps and the financial tools that Apple creates, Apple Pay being an example, versus these external sources? And the argument that is being made that they are leveraging their technology, the tool, be, to be able to control the market on these other parts that sit in play. Google controls search. So we're looking at, in that arena, the technological arena, we're looking at a single company do completely dominating an industry. Yeah. Now, there's three possible competitors we've talked about. And if one of them became so large that they were providing healthcare to 70% uh, of Americans, Absolutely, we need to put in place something akin to what we do with utilities. There's an oversight regulatory body that looks at the rates that they're charged. It has to obtain approval. There are consumers sitting on the board that's looking at it. I'm less concerned about it happening in medicine. And actually, I do want to point out that if you start with this question of capitation, so now we're going to get a single payment to take care of a population of patients. What's the next thing we have to do? We have to consolidate. We have to get volume because no one doctor can take care of all the problems these patients are going to get. So now we need primary care and specialty care, surgeons, medical interventionists, a lot of diagnostic radiologists, psychiatrists. So we need to create size, scale, and the scope. And now the real question is going to be, are we going to be paying more for that service or less than today? I want to make this point in great detail to listeners that don't make the fallacy, the cognitive bias that technology has to be perfect or assume that humans are. When there's 400,000 misdiagnoses a year killing patients and we lower that using technology to 100,000, I can guarantee you the headlines will talk about the 100,000 people who died, not the 300,000 who would have died. Because that's how we as humans, the bias that we have, will this generative AI technology specifically, and I say generative AI because there's a, two other kinds of AI that are, have problems in this arena. But for generative AI, will it make pr privacy, security, misinformation worse than what otherwise exists? My feeling is no. Will these companies coming in raise prices compared to what would happen the $3 trillion increased cost, my gut tells me. I don't know what they're going to do. They haven't told me. My gut tells me the answer is no. Will they use their power to charge more than they might otherwise? Possibly. 
but will it be less than it otherwise would be? I'm pretty confident that it would. And we've seen that in all these other disrupted industries. And I don't see healthcare being any different. This is a podcast about ethics and technology. What ethical questions did your research for this book and your experiment writing this book with ChatGPT open up about generative AI, about healthcare and medicine, and about the dynamic interplay between those two terms? Well, I love addressing ethical issues. Uh, I think they are very vital to be examined and looked at. And unlike some of the scientific issues, there's never a single right answer. So I can offer my thoughts about some of the ethical concerns. And I'd say these ethical concerns are much more for generative AI in general than they are specific to healthcare. The biggest one is called the existential threat. Generative AI is a self-learning tool. Right now, it's dependent upon learning from humans. But again, a decade from now, at the rate that it's improving, it'll be a thousand times more powerful. And it can start teaching itself. That's some of the way that it was able to create a program to be able to win uh, at chess, to be able to win at Go and some other games. So it could take over humanity. It has that possibility. If it was improperly prompted and it was told that it had to maximize money and you, you were an uh, organization that went in there after the disaster, it could take down power poles and electrical grids in other ways. So we don't know what would happen. That existential question is there. But I'll go back to what I said a second ago, Deb, which is, is it going to be worse than what exists right now? Because climate, we're not doing a really good job around. And war, we're not doing a terrific job around right now. And so will it minimize that or increase that? That's the perspective we have, we have to have. And I think in this area of existential threat, I don't know. I don't know if the threat of technology taking over or climate destroying us is worse. So everyone can have their opinion, which it is. But that's an area of major ethical concern. The second area is embedded in all of this kind of technology, which is bias. What we know is that most of these machines are trained on what humans do. And humans act in biased ways. We don't see it, though. What we know is that black patients, as an example, are given 30% less pain medication for the same procedure after, compared to white patients. We know that during COVID, when black patients were dying more frequently, they were tested for COVID with the same symptoms less often and in a classic study that I describe in ChatGPT MD, there was a study where uh, United Healthcare wanted to provide added resources to people with chronic disease. And they used an AI application to do that. And they discovered that only a quarter of the number of black patients who shouldn't have received this added payment got it. Headline screamed AI is discriminatory. What was really happening? It used the information of how much care we provide to black patients compared to white patients. It found that we provide in healthcare today $1,800 less per patient who has the same insurance and the same medical problems due to implicit bias. And it duplicated that. So that's another area of concern. A third area of major ethical concern is misinformation. There is an increasing number of bad actors in this world who want to convince people that uh, lies and falsehood are truths. You're an expert in the political realm. We can go there on another podcast. But here, I would say in the medical realm, there's still an opportunity. And last month, an organization called, called Change Health that provides the link between insurers and patients had a ransomware attack and went down and it cost $14 billion. And patients were caught in the middle unable to get uh, replacements of their medication. This, these ethical and other societal concerns are huge, but the question really is, are they worse than the alternatives? And I think that that remains an unanswered question, as explored, as you say, in great detail in part four of the book. I think we have time for one last question. A lot of students from around the globe listen to Technically Human. I think we're in over 80 countries now. I think a lot of them listen to the show because they are budding technologists and budding humanists who want to understand how those two things fit together and how they might better fit together 
in the future of tech and human values. What would you want that global cohort of students, particularly those who might go into work with generative AI or with healthcare or with both to know or understand or consider as they navigate the new healthcare GAI revolution? We've talked today predominantly about American healthcare. And the reason I write about it and speak about it is that it's the one I know best. And if people want more information, they go to my homepage, which is robertperlmd.com, where there's a lot more material on the topic. But everything we talked about today is just applicable in other countries because chronic disease is rising everywhere. I just had a chance to be in the Philippines where I did cleft lip surgery for children with birth defects um, on a mission trip. And chronic renal disease and kidney failure was very rampant due to diabetes. So these are not predominantly American problems. I've just provided them in the American context that's sitting there. So the first thing that I would say is that, and they know this already, generative AI is going to be a massive part of technology. And the people who are good at doing it are going to have no problem getting great jobs. In fact, right now they are in the tremendous demand from every company out there doing so. So hone your skills in generative AI, but you already know that. The second part, though, where they may not know it is that the technology is going to advance. There are some roadblocks that potentially stand ahead. It requires chips that NVIDIA makes predominantly, and there's a shortage of those chips in the world, so we're going to have to build chip manufacturing plants. It's high energy intensive to, in order to download all the data. So these are problems that will need to be addressed. But from a technological standpoint, they will get solved. I think the biggest set of opportunities is figuring out how we can create the training tools for doctors and patients around using it. It's a major part of why I published the book, to encourage People who are on this, I'll say, the um, line between technology and healthcare, who should have a foot on each side, how do we create ways to educate patients? How do we see this technology through the lens of the person using it? You asked me earlier about regulatory issues, and I often make the analogy between generative AI and a telephone. Regulators can regulate whether a telephone is going to get light on fire or explode and make sure that it doesn't happen. But they can't regulate what you talk about on the phone. And we often make major mistakes in the conversations we have with other people, but you just can't regulate that. The same is going to be true for generative AI. You can eliminate the technology completely, but what's um, the idea that somehow you can regulate how people are going to use it, they're going to use it in their home however they want to use it. That's going to be the reality. But we can help them to use it better. How do they make sure they put information in correctly? How do they make sure they're able to easily download the totality of what's required? How do they ask question after question? And the data has says that it takes about 10 hours to train someone to be able to use what is called prompts effectively. And I think the next big set of opportunities will be um, educational approaches that are able to uh, find ways to get people to be able to accomplish in healthcare. They're going to have to learn the uh, technological tricks about how you can do download information. They're going to have to learn the prompts to be able to be used, and they're going to have to have a good understanding of when they can trust the technology to provide the healthcare or when they need to consult a healthcare professional. I want to leave people with one last thought. I said it earlier. I want to say it again. What exists today is not yet ready to do the things that I described earlier. Simultaneously, it will be here in the very near future. And today is the time to get experience and to figure out what you're going to do once the technology becomes as good as it will be through its exponential growth over the next three to five years. Well, thank you so much, Robbie. It's been a pleasure being with you, Deb. And uh, please let me know what the students and the listeners think about our conversation and the ideas they might have so I can include it as I provide follow-up to my book, ChatGPT MD. Looking forward to the next read.